Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine War Update extra video giving you the extra information and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war. We're going to be talking a lot about sort of Russia, Russian war doctrine, uh, where they went wrong to begin with, what their doctrine is if they are indeed using something called uh, deep battle, deep operation sort of tactics or strategy doctrine. Uh, and then we're going to talk about logistics. And if if I'm still going, there's more to talk about, but I might have to split it into two. You know what it's like with me. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to refer back to this foreign affairs article for the third time. Check out my previous couple of extras, which have been talking about this. It's an absolutely fantastic article by Dara Massacre. What Russia got wrong. Talked about. We've already talked about where it's gone wrong uh, b before, where it went wrong before the war started, and the fact that it saw it as a special military operation, and then it became a war, and they weren't really uh, prepared for the war. Uh, and then we uh, talked about you know what went wrong during the initial phases of the war, uh, and then we're moving on to uh, another another sort of area to discuss as we move towards the end of the article. Um, so, according to the Washington Post, the Russian intelligence services had their own pre-war covert polling, suggesting that only 48% of the population was ready to defend Ukraine. So again, this, this is referring back, as ever, to the initial issue of Russia going into Ukraine, thinking that it would be welcomed with open arms, and so therefore they didn't need to go to war. This wasn't actually a war to begin with. It was a special military operation. They were going to depose the government over a two to 15 day period and then clear up afterwards, all be fine. But then they found the Ukrainians didn't fancy that happening and were up for defending their sovereign homeland. And it became a war, and a war that the Russians were then completely unplanned uh, for dealing with and for executing. So this is, a, again, according to the Washington Post, the Russian intelligence services had their own pre-war covert polling, suggesting that 48% of the population was ready to defend. Of course, was this true, ready to defend Ukraine? Zelensky's approval rating was less than 30% on the eve of the war. Russia's intelligence agencies had an extensive spy network inside Ukraine to set up a collaborationist government. In fact, Ukraine later arrested and charged 651 people for treason and collaboration, including several officials in its security services. Uh, Russian planners may have also assumed that Ukraine's forces would not be ready because the Ukrainian government did not move to a war footing until a few weeks before the invasion. So there was this talk about the war. Uh, brewing. There was UK and US intelligence services saying there's going to be a war that went out in the newspapers and then Russia denied this. And actually, you know, broadly speaking, no one believed the intelligence services of the UK and US, including largely the Ukrainians, and they didn't have uh, things in place. Now, uh, what is, is worth remembering is the psychology of people being threatened. One of the greatest ways to unite people is to have a common enemy. So if if we're all arguing with each other on earth at the moment and everyone's like, oh, I hate the Russians, the Russians are like, I hate the Americans, the Chinese are like, we hate the Americans in, and, and Europeans are like, we hate the Chinese and so on and so forth, and, you know, whatever. The world is not getting on with each other. And then aliens attacked earth. Everyone would be like, Right, we'll put those issues aside. We need to protect ourselves. We've got an existential threat from the aliens. So the whole world would unite. When you have a common enemy, everyone puts aside their differences and unites. So I don't think this was factored in when Russia would think about, should we attack U Ukraine? Well, only 30% of them uh, support Zelensky. And we're looking at 48% of the population ready to defend. Okay, so I think we can manipulate these guys in such a way, and when we attack, they're, they're not going to be bothered about defending their nation. The problem is, you know, everyone unites behind uh, a, a a common defense of this this threat coming from the outside, in the same way that the world would unite against aliens. So I don't, yeah, as I say, I don't think that factored in. And then you have this other problem, and I'll continue here, um, that, uh, well, okay, 
the article continues, they likely thought that Ukraine's artillery munitions would quickly run out based on the West's response to Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 and its relatively small arms provisions during a run-up to the war in 2022. Moscow might reasonably have assumed that the United States and Europe would not provide major support for Ukraine, or at least not in time. I, which is another thing. So not only did that happen, but the West came to to help in a quite unified fashion Ukraine. But here, here's the interesting thing. But the Ukraine, but the Kremlin, sorry, was evaluating data points that simply allowed it to see what it wished to see. So it's like, okay, well, thirty percent of people have support for Zelensky. That that's that's not that's not a good approval rating. Forty eight percent would defend. Okay. So the, this is great data to support our desire to attack uh, Russia. Uh, sorry, to attack Ukraine. However, what were they ignoring? So the same intelligence services poll, for instance, suggested that 84% of Ukrainian respondents would consider Russian forces to be occupiers and not liberators. Now, that's massively important. If you're going to ignore that in favour of... Th this is called, and I talk about this all the time, confirmation bias. I'm, uh, you know, susceptible to this. You are, we all are. Uh, but, you know, intelligence services and big decision makings in government should really be aware of this to mitigate um, against making really poor decisions based on this. So here they, they, they put value on the data that supports their intentions and ignore or put less value on the data that doesn't support their intentions. In other words, they have a bias that confirms what they want to happen or what they think is the state of affairs. So the United States and its allies broadcast Russia's plans and various attempts to generate a pretext for invasion, and they warned Russia privately and publicly that the uh, country would face enormous repercussions if it started a war. Yet apparently, no one in Putin's inner circle convinced him that he should revise Russia's approach and prepare for a different, harder type of conflict, one in which Ukrainians fought back and received substantial Western assistance. So they didn't adapt their planning in light of all this. Now, they might have looked at, say, 2014 and Crimea and, and thought, well, yeah, America might be saying that, but they said that in 2014, they're just paying lip service. And the American government then was weak. They're going to be weak again. You know, Biden was Obama's VP at the time, vice president. So, you know, it's just going to be same, same, except it wasn't the same. And, and America re reacted uh, exceptionally strongly, all things considered, and especially looking at what happened again in 2014. The massive and so not only that, but they were given a massive and diverse weapons provision, uh, and this enabled Ukrainian forces to gain a qualitative edge over Moscow's troops in terms of battlefield awareness during Russia's initial push on Kyiv, and it allowed Ukraine to conduct precision strikes on Russian logistics depots and command centers in the eastern regions. HIMARS, HIMARS was a huge game changer. And I, I had uh, a pro-Russian today say, well, because I said there are no equivalents to HIMARS. And he pointed out that there are there are a couple of uh, tornadoes, for example, tornado GM uh, Gimlers, Russian rocket, multiple launch rocket system. He says they are, they've got equivalents. So you're just talking rubbish. It's like, okay, how many of these have they got? How often do they use them? And do they use them in the guided capability or basically as glorified grad launchers? So sending up, unguided missiles. He said, we've got video evidence of them being used. Yeah, we've got video evidence of some, a couple of these being sending off rockets. Okay. Yeah. Are they guided or not? Yeah, but they've hit Kharkiv. They've hit Krivi Rear. Yeah. Big cities being hit by rockets is fairly easy. What's, what's the, what's the evidence that we've got that, that these tornadoes that are supposedly equivalents of HIMARS are being used to, to make, you know, important, uh, precision strikes in a way that HIMARS have. Okay, I'm still waiting for that evidence. And it, and if you can give me a couple of instances where uh, tornadoes are being used, and uh, that's still not equivalent considering that HIMARS is being used every night, and you've got, what, 22 plus, maybe 30 now? I don't know. HIMARS being used pretty much every night uh, to take out logistics depots and supplies and uh, troop accumulations on a massive scale. So I don't think that is an equivalent. Anyway, you know, back to the article. This was a, a really big um, way of obtaining competitive advantage and an asymmetry in, in sort of military performance. 
Uh, not only that, but the US was providing and NATO was providing vital and high-end intelligence to Kiev. So we talked about this uh, quite a bit recently. Uh, and this has basically led to, you know, you put all of these things together and Russia has really struggled. All the things that I talked about in the previous two videos when we discussed this article. Now, it's very easy to get carried away with the, the, that kind of positivity. But Russia is a, is a big army and... They're, they're not all like stupid. They seem to have made a lot of incompetent decisions based on very faulty intelligence. But they are they, they are learning and they are adapting. So he, let's look at some of the positives for the Russian you know performance so far and going forward. Uh, so Putin is certainly digging in for the long haul, says the article. And although wounded, the Russian military is still capable of complex operations, adaptive learning and withstanding a level of combat that few militaries in the world can. Sustained high intensity, high attrition, combined war arms warfare is extraordinarily difficult. And Russia and Ukraine now have more recent experience with it than any other country in the world. Take, for example, the VKS. So this is the Russian Air Force. Although its pilots have failed to suppress enemy, uh, Ukraine's air defences, analysts must remember that such missions are notoriously time-consuming and difficult, as US pilots have noted. The VKS is learning, and rather than continuing to waste aircraft by flying more conservative and less effective missions, it is trying to wear down Ukrainian air defences by using empty Soviet-era missiles and Shahid drones purchased from Iran. Now, this is quite interesting because, yes, on the one hand, we did see the, the Russian Air Force pull back and adapt to the fact that they were losing... Uh, unsustainable numbers of aircraft and more importantly pilots and crew members and and they were operating from behind uh certain ranges so on and so forth and and you know dropping sending off missiles well behind their own lines and then turning around and going back now interestingly as russia has become more and more desperate for success in the bakhmut area what have we seen? So in the last couple of weeks, we have seen Russian aircraft being lost multiple times a day, uh, uh, particularly around Bakhmut. So we've seen on certain days, like four days in a row, I think we had like Russian fixed wing aircraft lost and helicopters also lost. It's, I think one of the worst days was like six, five or six um, aircraft lost in one single day. So this this then shows that, yeah, they do learn and they do get conservative. But when there's a lot of pressure for success, when when it's like, right, we need to show the Wagner aren't so successful. So you get this infighting. We need the regular forces to do their combined arms things well and show that we can do this. And we're going to take over from. Wagner and we're going to win Bakhmut. Right, we want that and, and Putin wants everything you know done by um, March, so on and so forth. You send in the air, the Air Force again and they get hit. Yeah, they might be causing problems, but the losses have been fairly substantial for the last week or so. So yes, they do adapt, but then they also have a tendency to just go back to operating as they were previously. But otherwise, the Russians have adapted with the use of uh, Shahid drones, their S-300s at the moment, and uh, cruise missile saturation bombing attacks to take out the uh, infrastructure. The Russian military also appears to be getting better at performing some of the most dangerous army maneuvers of all crossing rivers under fire. And the article talks about the withdrawal across the Dnieper River uh, being comparatively smooth, partly because it was better planned. So that's Surovikin coming in saying we need to take a defensive posture and we're going to withdraw to shorten the uh, the, the front line uh, to give a higher troop density. But also we're, we're losing people here and they've cut off, if you remember, they cut off all the bridges and the logistics routes across the Dnieper River. So they were effectively, the Russian army was cut off there uh, and they've been duped into sending loads of forces there because th there was claims of a massive counterattack. They pulled them in there and then blew up the bridges behind them and then they were stuck there. So. But the Russians did very successfully withdraw across there. But Surovikin showing actually a bit of nous. Or so, yeah. and then other other adaptations. In late spring, Russian forces finally succeeded in jamming Ukrainian communications without jamming their own. Although that is still a problem. Um, there was a partial mobilization that got three hundred thousand uh, draftees into, it, and this had shored up their defensive positions. Uh, incrementally, incrementally putting the Russian economy onto a wartime footing has helped the state get ready for a long uh, conflict. And these modifications are starting to show results, says the article. 
Although Russia is running low on missiles, it has expanded its inventory by repurposing anti-ship cruise missiles and air defense missiles. So this is use of the S-300s and other missiles that are not used in their primary mode, um, such as ship missiles being used as basically cruise missiles. And in fact, you know, was that not one of those types of... Yeah, it was a ship missile that was used against the Ukrainians and it hit the residential apartment block in Dnipro and blew that up because it was, you know, it wasn't being fired over the sea uh, and its guidance system was was not ideal for such urban settings. Anyway, the Russian military has not yet improved its battle damage assessment process or its ability to strike moving targets. I mean, that's a huge problem. Uh, but it's now hitting Ukraine's electrical grid with precision. I mean, it's took out 40% of it at one point, uh, taking electricity out for 10 million people. So Ukraine has benefited from more external report, however, than Russia. And this is a huge and important asymmetry, especially when that support, economies win wars, right? Economies win wars, not necessarily, you know, tactics on a battlefield. Russia's economy is a, a, a broadly, in terms of GDP, is equivalent to Belgium and Netherlands put together. It's less than 10% of Europe's GDP. This, the defence spending, NATO's defence spending is something like 17.8 times larger than Russia's defence spending. The question who's going to win this war, unless China gets directly involved, the question of who's going to win this war is, is very simply answered, Russia will lose it and Ukraine will win this war. Because Ukraine's economy isn't just Ukraine's economy, it is being bankrolled by NATO and the West and their armed forces. And they have vastly deeper pockets than Russia vastly and essentially this is kind of all, all you need to know about where this war is going now as long as the west keeps supporting and the rhetoric is they're going to support for as long as it takes russia can't win this war you can talk about troops you can talk about i don't know so on and so forth on on the battlefields but economically speaking russia can't win this war uh, and that's a lesson that should be learned from history. Wars are won by who's got the deepest pockets, economically speaking, and Russia don't. Uh, after weeks of devastating high Mars, the uh, article continues, uh, attacks during the summer of 2022, Russia moved its command sites and many logistics de depots out of range. Russian forces have shown more competence on the defensive than on the offensive, particularly in the south, where they have created layered defensive that were difficult for Ukrainian forces to fight through. And in fact, there's absolutely loads of defenses built now right across uh, the occupied territories of Ukraine that the Russians uh, control and they have taken a much more defensive posture and they've adapted that uh, kind of an adaptation that has been successful for the Russians under Surovikin who's far more defensive however in January 2023, so last month, Surovikin was demoted in favour of General Valery Gerasimov. Although the reasons for this command change are unclear, palace intrigue and cronyism may be behind it rather than any specific failure of Surovikin's leadership. And no Russian commander has been able to break Ukraine's will to fight, even though Russia continues to launch missiles that inflict suffering on the Ukrainian people. The, the, the thing is now, Surovikin had, had put defensive stuff in place that has, I think, put the Russians in much better stead than they otherwise would have been. Because if Ukraine wants to take back their territory, which is obviously the Ukrainian intention, then they are going to have they are going to struggle far more now, given all the defensive uh, work that the Russians have done, than they would have done had the Russians not done that defensive work. That's mines, that's trenches, that's revetments, that's dragon's teeth. All of these things you might laugh at them individually, but put them all together, uh, that 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 is an obstacle to overcome. It means you won't get these Thunder Road, really quick, lightning counter-offensives like you saw in Kharkiv. That won't happen again. Now, what's interesting is now that, now that Gerasimov's in charge, then you're going to think that he's been put in charge because they want to move to an offensive posture. And Putin is saying, I want this by the end of March, arguably. I mean, this is what we're hearing from Ukrainian intelligence, so it might not be true. But the, the rumors are that Putin has said, I want this by the end of March. Now, if that's the case, he's putting undue pressure on the Russian armed forces to do things that doesn't fit in with what their capability and capacity is at, at the, the time in question. And it means that they are going to rush things. So are we seeing this situation now where Russia are putting on an offensive sooner than they are ready to do so? because there is undue pressure from above to to gain certain geographical objectives um, before they're ready to attempt that. 
Anyway, that, that there is the, the conclusion of that article, just a few more bits, but I won't go through that today. Let's then move on because I keep talking about, right, what is the situation at the moment? Like what what is, what is, uh, and I asked this this morning in both my articles, sorry, both my uh, videos. Uh, are we seeing the Russian, are we seeing the Russian offensive now or offensives? And if we are, is that just completely underwhelming? It appears so. And if it's not the Russian offensives, what is it? Because they appear to be pre-offensive, uh, attritional kind of offensives, pre-offensive offensives that are attritional and and grinding down Russia's own capacity. Yes, it might be grinding down the Ukrainians as well. But we were talking from a Russian point of view, they're burning up a load of equipment in Avdivka and Vukladar. Uh, Kremlin is being pretty costly for them. And obviously Bakhmut. Uh, that and so what's going on? Um, just trying to work this out. Well, it could well be that they are doing something which is a, a Soviet do doctrine from you know actually from the nineteen twenties and thirties called deep operation or deep uh, Soviet deep battle. Okay, so I'm just going to read you just a wiki entry uh, about this to just see whether this fits with what they're doing now. Uh, so it was developed by the Soviet Union during the 20s and 30s, and it was a tenet that emphasized destroying, suppressing, or disorganizing enemy forces, not only at the line of contact, but also throughout the depth of the battlefield. Deep operations had two phases, the tactical battle followed by the exploitation of tactical successes known as uh, the conduct of deep battle operations. Deep battle envisaged the breaking of the enemy's forward defences or tactical zones through combined arms assaults, which would be followed up by fresh, uncommitted mobile operational reserves sent to exploit the strategic depth of an enemy front. The goal of a deep operation was to inflict a decisive strategic defeat on the enemy's logistical abilities and render the defence of their front more difficult, uh, impossible or irrelevant. Unlike most other doctrines, deep battle stressed combined arms operation at all levels, strategic, operational, and tactical. Therein lies a big problem for this because actually the Russians have shown themselves completely inept at doing combined arms activity at all levels. What they're trying to do is, is get more uniformity within their army. So you're seeing Wagner being phased out and you're seeing DPR and LPR being assimilated into the Russian regular forces. However, the, the Air Force, the Navy, um, logistics, uh, intelligence and the army, uh, especially when you're taking into account mobilized troops, convicts, all these kind of disparate ty types of, of you know military co components, they are struggling to do that kind of combined arms. And if that's a, a central part of this, we could have a weak link. Uh, then there is also the logistics weak link that we'll come on to speak about in a second. Um, so when we go to the to the um, map, we we might put this in, con in, in the context of, of Ukraine right now, which is, okay, let's attack Kupiansk, let's attack Kremena, let's attack Bakhmut, let's try Fasiversk, let's try Avdivka, and let's try Vukladar. And to some degree, a little bit down here by Orochid. Okay, we're going to probe, attack, attack, attack in, in fairly considerable numbers to try and exploit a weakness. And when we find that weakness, then we go for your deep operation, your deep battle. And we pile in our kind of second echelon to, to attack there. So the, the doctrine, here's the principle. So deep battle encompass maneuver by multiple Soviet army front size formation simultaneously. It was not meant to deliver a victory in a single operation. Instead, multiple operations, which might be conducted in parallel or successively, would induce a catastrophic failure in the enemy's defensive system. Each operation served to divert enemy attention and keep the defender guessing about where the main effort and the main objective lay, which is kind of what's happening now. Well, what is the main objective? Is it Kremlin? Is it Svatova? Is it Kupiansk? Is it Bakhmut? Is it Seversk? Is it Kramatorsk and Slobyansk? Is it the whole of the Donbass? Is it Zaporizhia? Is it um, Vukladar and coming up? You know, what is it? Uh, in doing so, it prevented the enemy from dispatching powerful mobile reserves to the area. The army could then, well, so again, context of that, which is to say, um, okay, so they're attacking Kupiansk. So if they, if they were just sort of attacking Kupiansk, the Ukrainians would then pile in their, all their reserves to Kupiansk to take this one offensive attacking Kupiansk. But actually, they don't know whether it's Kupiansk because it could well be Kremlin 
and it could well be Bakhmut, and it could well be Avdivka and Vukladar. So the Ukrainians themselves are thinking, well, where do we spread our defences? And there's this kind of de- disorganisation or chaos because when you're not quite sure exactly what they're planning and whether it's one or many offensives going on. And, you know, it prevents the enemy from dispatching powerful mobile reserves to the area. The army could then overrun vast regions before the defender could recover. The diversion operations also frustrated an opponent trying to conduct an elastic defense. So these diversionary operations, you then look down here at Orochi, was that just the diversionary operations? So that happened one week ago now, was it? Over between one and two weeks. Just at the same time, they were starting to ramp up operations all up this front. Was that diversion? So they sent defenders down from there were claims that def- that reserves came from Bakhmut to defend Vukladar, uh, and you know in the Orkhiv area that they were pulling reserves. So was this what the the um, doctrine suggests? Um, you know, as the opponent is trying to conduct an elastic defence, the supporting operations had significant strategic objectives themselves, and supporting units were to continue their offensive actions until they were unable to progress any further. There's an interesting thing. So you just keep doing this until you can go no further. Well, the problem is you end up exhausting yourself and you can, you're right for a counterattack. So there could be a bit of a problem there. However, they were still subordinated to the main decisive strategic objective determined by the Stavka. Uh, each of the operations along the front would have secondary strategic goals. And one of these operations would usually be aimed towards a primary objective. So it could be that uh, you've got all these things going on, but one of these actually has a primary objective. So the primary objective could be, for example, Siversk. And you've got Kremena, that attack that's, that's that, yeah, we want you to go and take Toriska and get past the, the water course here. But actually, you know, and Bakhmut, we want you to take Bakhmut, but there, there's a primary goal here of actually Siversk. So the Kremena objective might be coming down to Siversk. But you've got other secondary objectives. So it could be to get past the Oskil River up here. It could be to take Vukladar to move on to Kurokhova. Uh, it could be Marienka and Vukladar coming together for a pincer movement on that. Those could, would be kind of secondary objectives. Um, so uh, the strategic objective or mission was to secure the primary strategic target. The primary target usually consisted of a geographical objective and the destruction of a proportion of the enemy armed forces. Usually the strategic missions of each operation were carried out by a Soviet front. The front itself usually had several shock armies attached to it, which were to converge on the target and encircle or insult it. Uh, assault it, not insult it. I mean, anyone can insult anyone. Uh, the means of securing it was the job of the division and its tactical components, which Soviet deep battle termed the tactical mission. And then finally, I'm just going to uh, come down to this bit, deep operations engagement. Having organized the operational forces and secured a tactical breakthrough into the operational rear of the enemy front, several issues took shape about how the Red Army would engage the main operational enemy forces. Attacking in echelon formation denied the Soviet forces a chance to bring all their units to bear. That might lead them to defeat to, to the defeat of a shock army against a superior enemy force. This is the idea that they're already spread fairly thin around everywhere. So if they found this weakness, say, in Kremena, and then piled their kind of second echelon in, into Kremena and what they had left, this army isn't actually as strong as it could be because they are, have elements of offensive operations going on all along the front. So they then pile into Kremena with a bunch of extra, in this case, mobilized troops, other reserve tr- troops or units they've got held back. Uh, and whatever material they can get hold of. But if if Ukraine actually have decent forces in the area and are able to defend that, or maybe even have superior forces, then the Russians might not have enough to succeed in in that engagement. And and that is indeed a a potential problem. It might lead to the defeat of a shock army against a superior enemy force, it says. To avoid such a situation, echelon forces were to strike at the flanks of enemy concentrations for the first few days of the assault, while the main mobile forces caught up. The aim was of this was to avoid a head-on clash and tie down enemy forces from reaching the tactical zones. The expected scope of the operation could be 150 to 200 kilometers. If the attack proved successful in pinning the enemy in place and defeating its forces in battle, mechanized forces would break the flank and surround the enemy with infantry to consolidate the success. Now, next problem here is the Russians don't necessarily have that mechanized uh, equipment. In, in I mean, they are losing hand over fist mechanized equipment up and down the front line. Do they have that in reserve to send out? And if they do have it, what's the quality of it? Is it BMP ones that have been mothballed previously and have been brought out and given a lick of paint and a new set of wheels? 
is it is is it good enough to overcome what the Ukrainians will be using? And if they're starting to get Bradleys in and so on and so forth, by the time it comes to using this stuff, like is that good enough? Really, really important questions to be answered, I would say. Um, as the defender withdrew, mechanized cavalry and motorized forces would harass, cut off, and destroy this, his retreating columns, which should also be assaulted by powerful aviation forces. We just haven't seen the, the Russians be able to do this in the whole course of the war. And we haven't really seen uh, the, the air force being used effectively in this way because they don't have air supremacy. Right. So it's in great it's great in, in, in principle this using combined arms offensives. But if there's still if if there's still troops with like plenty of stingers and man pads being able to take out those those pieces of air, aircraft, those aircraft, and if they've got air defense systems still operational, then you aren't going to be able to support your troops in that way. And they don't have that, so so there's a yet another weakness. Um uh, the pursuit would be pushed as far into the enemy depth as possible until exhaustion set in. Oh, that's hugely problematic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, with the tactical zones defeated and the enemy operational forces either destroyed or incapable of, or, or of further defence, Soviet forces could push into the strategic depth. And it goes on to talk about logistics after this, right? Uh, because, of course, you, you can't keep pushing and pushing until you're exhausted uh, without being supplied consistently to do so otherwise you get cut off and you, you know you've got nothing you've got no ammunition i mean that is in the sense what exhaustion would be but you do, you can do that for longer and longer if you have consistent logistics and supplies so this is where we come to talk about logistics and good old trent Telenko and what he has to say about this so logistics over the last few days the media uh, and not a few accounts on twitter have run for the clickbait from this foreign policy article not the one i've been using by the way a different one um talking about how russia is sending more bodies ukraine doesn't have enough and the tanks won't arrive in time uh ukraine braces for a grisly russian offensive in the east um a clickbait numbers quote from the article Ukrainian military estimates Russia already has 1,800 tanks, 3,950 armored vehicles, 2,700 artillery systems, 810 Soviet era multiple launch, lo rocket launch systems such as Grad and Smirch, 400 fighter jets, and 300 helicopters ready for the new wave of attacks. And uh, Trent Delenko says the New York Times even broke out this clickbait map of the great Donbass encirclement. You have seen paid pro Russian energy creatures posting for the last year and he links a new york times article saying similar things the problem with these clickbait numbers and the great encirclement map is the russians simply didn't have the logistical truck lift for secure radio signals density to do that in february 2022 okay so that's a year ago they didn't have the logistical capabilities to do that to do these kind of offensives the russians have lost on the order of half of their tactical truck fleet by now. Worse, the arrival of HIMARS and Gimler's combination in Ukrainian hands has pushed Russian truck logistics back 100 kilometers further. And this is where, and I've shown you this, this tweet thread before from NL War Tracker, uh, talking about how they've ad the Russians have adapted, but it does mean that they're now logistics hubs and routes and whatnot are 100 kilometers back behind the front lines that, that they are using as offensive fronts to do the attacks. And the idea that the Russians can simultaneously launch a major offensive south from Belarus and western Ukraine is utterly brain dead for some the same truck logistical reasons. So if you believe that R Russia is going to be attacking from Belarus, uh, given their logistical headaches they have even operating on the, tr on the front lines that they have right now, then you're going to be, you know, you're... Yeah, you're onto a loser. This decay of Russian truck lift capability is why I make a big fat hairy deal whenever I see Russian forces using trailers with their tactical trucks because they will double Russian truck lift the moment they are deployed in numbers matching the truck park. Um, so he had previously said things are getting serious with uh, Russian logistics. The Russian army is actually using cargo trailers with their trucks after 10 months of war. In other words, they don't have the trucks. So they're going to, in order to have two trucks, they have one truck with a trailer. Uh, seeing two brain cells rub together anywhere in Russian truck logistics amounts to a significant operational change. Uh, so he's pretty damning about that. So he continues now. The second issue for the renewed Russian offensive, signals, that's comms, hasn't really been addressed by anyone. So let's see, set the Wayback Machine to this thread 
um, from the 1st of March 2022 on how hollowed by corruption Russian forces radios were. And it goes into talk, uh, there's a big conversation about how Russian comms were, were terrible back a year ago, uh, concluding almost no one can get hold of a central command. It's not even a matter of jamming. There's just no long range combo equipment or relays that went with the troops to Ukraine. So he carries on now, and th this tweet on the 28th of February 2022 uh, on how much Russian forces relied on Chinese-made civilian band hand radios, had banned hand radios in the first days of this latest Russian invasion of Ukraine. So, and there are there is loads of photographic evidence of these Ukraine. They they look like Russian radios, but you take off this face, uh, and actually it's a Chinese radio underneath that they've just kind of repackaged. Um, and this Rob Lee tweet uh, and a thread explains the Russian corruption scandal buying the R187P1 Azart digital radios resulted in this substitution. And uh, yeah, just huge issues with Russian communications. Because the Russian forces have been using insecure radios, so remember at the beginning of the war, they were using radios that could be um, that were insecure and loads of commanders got killed. By, because we knew where they were using insecure radios. And you remember that. They had a high attrition rate of, of the higher echelons of command taken out because of this, or partly because of this. Ukraine has been systematically killing high, well, yeah, here you go, high value Russian targets revealed by them. This link uh, has the following observations. The loss of specialists like artillery forward observers and similar specialists who accompanied the combat troops was high during the first months of the war because Russians sent most of these specialists in with the invading combat troops so they could gain some low-risk combat experience. These specialists were killed in large numbers. Send in these specialists because this is going to be an easy war. We're just going to walk into Ukraine. It won't be a problem, and they can get some good uh, understanding of how to do war and good training, effectively. It didn't turn into that, and they all got wiped out. Was was putting that in, in simple terms. Um uh, so, sorry, these specialists were killed in large numbers along with the troops they accompanied. The dead included instructors from, instructors from the schools that trained new specialists. I have a few observations to add to strategypage.com. Uh, but first, Ukraine hasn't gone after just forward observers. They have been systematically targeting Russian artillery command posts and counter-battery radars for capture and killing in ground attacks and with American harm systems, respectively. So, just to translate that. Harm, system, harm missiles go for radiation. They they target radiation, so they take out radar settlement, uh, radar installations. So Ukraine have been hitting those hard. Now, I spoke to you a couple of mm, a month and a half ago, maybe, or something, about the different figures in terms of lost vehicles and vehicle types between the Russians and Ukrainians. And there was broadly light for like in terms of air defences, but loads more IFVs, but then you look at the types of IFVs and they're slightly different depending on which army it is. Loads of tanks, blah, blah, blah. But one of the interesting ones was command and control vehicles. So the Russians have lost an absolute bucket load of command and control vehicles. And the Ukrainians have lost hardly any. Like it's one of the biggest disparities in, in the figures lost, right? And that means something. It's not just like, oh, well, there you go. It's just a different type of vehicle and they've lost more of them. Actually, that, that you know, it's got to mean something. They're not just in those command and control vehicles just drinking tea and putting their feet up. Those have utility. And if they've lost a massive amount of those vehicles, they are losing some kind of capability. Okay. So, and this is what he's saying here. So see the attached infographic for where those command posts and radars are in the Russian counter battery system. And so you can see, you know, the the, the uh, function that they have and how if you take that functionality out of that, you know, flow chart, if you like, infographic, then you ain't going to get the outcomes that, that you want. So this has slowed down the speed of Russian counter battery fire from 20 or so minutes to near non-existent compared to March or April or May 2022. The counter battery radars were used as a wide sector queuing sensor to tell where the Orlan 10 and other Russian drones had to go in order to provide eyes on corrected artillery shoot. Since most of the low end Orlan 10 drones lacked laser rangefinder designators, they also had to fly directly over the prospective artillery target to get a GPS or GLOSNAS fix. So GLOSNAS is a way of, um, f that's not, not GPS, a way of locating targets that the Ukrainians can use. In their high miles equivalent, I talked about earlier, actually, they use GLOSNAS. Um, so, this is the idea that you start 
you start taking those command and control vehicles out and those radar systems out, you can't do all of this stuff, right? Uh, counter battery fire is, is rubbish. The time is either way down or they just can't do it. Um, and the use of drones becomes problematic. So the Ukrainians countered this by uh, placing manpad teams with every artillery battery to kill Russian drones. This worked mostly. Then the Russian campaign against the Ukrainian power grid saw a large fraction of these uh, Ukrainian artillery protecting manpads assets being placed into roving mobile anti-aircraft units to protect the Ukrainian power grid. This thinned out the manpad's density for Ukrainian artillery, but the fear of using radars in the surviving Russian counter-battery radars is such that the ra Russians seem to seldom use CB radars outside of large pre-planned set-piece attacks to suppress Ukrainian guns. In other words, they're still so afraid of harm missiles hitting these radar systems um, that that even though there aren't these sort of man pads to take out the drones and whatnot, they they're still not they're still not effectively using counter battery fire or or using these radar systems um, effectively. The video interview uh, in this Reddit post shows a N triple seven gun and the Ukrainians are using under an anti lancet drone fence, which is. Uh, been in the same position for seeming days. In other words, they're not worried about um, counter battery fire at the moment because there just isn't enough of it for the, as far as the Russians are concerned because they don't have that capability. The use of the Lancet fence um, at this N777 position is a good indication that Russian all and 10 q Lancet drone attacks are now the Ukrainian artillery's biggest counter battery threat. So rather than using actual counter battery radar systems to say, right, we've located the traject we understand the trajectory of the shell from a from a Ukrainian uh, howitzer, right? And we're going to use our radar, and we're going to uh, track that, and then we're going to fire back at that uh, artillery battery with our own battery and blow it up. We we can't do that because our command and control has gone, our radars have gone. So instead, what we're doing is we're using drones, all and ten drones, flying them over, picking out a uh, a, a target relaying that back to another drone operator who's operating a, a loitering munition like a lancet sending that up up and sending the lancet in so then so now what this means is the n triple seven the howitzer people are saying right so we're not really worried about counter battery fire so we're not really worried about an, another artillery round hitting us we have to move lots then uh but we're, we're worried about lancet so we just put a net above job done and there you go. So we can sit in place for a long period of time as long as we've got a net above us because they're just not using counter battery fire. So these all and 10 uh, limited field of view cameras are looking uh, like looking for something through a soda straw. So the most likely queuing sensor are Russian passive radio direction finding gear in electronic warfare units that are passing on GPS or GLOSNAS coordinates to all and 10 drone wranglers. But also be aware that the Ukrainians are using its own direction finding gear to locate all and 10 drone wranglers for artillery strikes like they did with the Russian forward observers. Forward observers are people spotting artillery rather than a drone spotting artillery. So the systematic annihilation of the Russian artillery forward observer corps, artillery command posts and counter to battery radars by the Ukrainians in the last year of the war leaves Russians incapable of generating the artillery firepower in February 2023 that could in February 2022. So let's put this back onto what we're saying. So not only is a truck lift, he was talking about logistics at the beginning, the truck lift, uh, in other words, the, the ability to supply forces is absolutely hammered. For the Russians, they're traditionally a railway army. They they had to use trucks instead because the Ukrainians blew up the railway lines coming into uh, Ukraine at the beginning of the war because they knew that Russia were a railway army and they flooded certain areas and they had to use trucks and the trucks got stuck and they were so poorly maintained the tires blew etc. And they only had four thousand trucks where they really need a hundred thousand trucks and that's that's the equivalent that the, the Americans have got to do the same kind of job and the Russians only have four thousand so they're now using even like as you, as you heard trailers or commercial trucks and stuff they are going to struggle in major offensives especially if there are lots of major offensives as they're trying to probe to find a weakness to then pile in now not only that but they are don't have effective use of radar and comms uh, and the comms affects their ability to uh, well to command and control right but also you know there's radar communication between uh, and communication between you know drones or uh, you know, the radar use of counter battery fire and all this kind of stuff that they need to conduct a proper offensive is just lacking. 
So you put all of this together, I think we, we're we possibly beginning to understand that it could be a form of deep um, deep operation uh, doctrine here um, and that Russia could be up against it. They could really be struggling. Um, what are they going to bring to the to the table? Uh, what extra material do they have? I don't know. I, I can't foresee they're going to bring an awful lot of extra great stuff because the question is why aren't they already using that why aren't they being used that last six months you know if, if these russian people in my threads are saying they've got equivalents to high miles okay well you've you've uh, where they're using them in some kind of mass way that high miles being used i know that i'm mainly giving you like pro-ukrainian stuff here and I'm, I'm not showing an awful lot of like ukrainian targets being hit by russians but really they're not being hit behind the lines to the same scale as as the the Ukrainians are hitting the Russians now, we are seeing cities get hit a lot. So we get again a lot of like MLRS attacks, which are unguided on Zaporizhia, on Helyapol, on Nikopol, on Marnets, on Kherson, on these places behind the line here, on Kramatorsk, Druzhkivka, so on and so forth. But are we seeing the kind of precision um, artillery uh, precision? ordnance use that we're seeing with high lines no like what what okay which means that they don't have it otherwise you would be seeing that so again the question is what if this isn't a full-on offensive or they're probing to find a weakness to then pile in a proper offensive like deep deep battle doctrine would suggest what are they going to send in for that second echelon is it just a whole bunch of mobilized troops with not very good material i don't know Anyway, uh, that that's all I've got. I've only gone through half of what I was hoping to talk about, but I've gone on way, 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 way too long. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. Uh, and I will get back to you tomorrow with the rest of what I was going to speak to, to you about today. The last thing I will say is please check out my article that's finally out. It's a good 5,000 word article. It is a big piece of kit, this. Uh, analysis who blew up the Nord Stream pipelines. I put a, a link in the description below. Um, please let me know what you think. I'd be really interested to see uh, if you think I've been fair with the data here. I changed my mind going through this article. I was like this as to who I thought was responsible. And in the end, my basic conclusion is I don't really know. I'm not sure Seymour Hirsch got it right. I'm fairly sure there's a big, there's a problematic article. I think the US has more to gain in certain respects, but they also have more to lose. So it's a, and they don't need to lose that. So I think it's too risky for the US to have done that. Russia don't have as much to lose, but actually they don't have as much to gain. But it could be an all in kind of do that kind of thing, a bit like on a poker table. Um, and I think of that kind of psychological level of like why would they design an operation like that? A bit like under Anders Puck Nielsen. I think that on balance, probably Russia did it, but it's not a huge confidence level that I have in that. I I, I can see really good arguments that that the US blew up the pipeline, and I can see some arguments as to why Russia blew it up. Uh, and the evidence, actual evidence, like Seymour Hirsch is trying to present evidence, is thoroughly problematic. And actually, the evidence doesn't really suggest anything because his evidence, I think, is is has got holes in it all over the shop. So, I think probably just Russia did it, but I wouldn't I wouldn't put a lot of money on on my uh, wager either way. Anyway, be really interested to see what you think. Let me know. Uh, take care. Speak to you tomorrow.